The Unshackled Waves, episode 254. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. I'm still not feeling the best, so episode production has not resumed to the regularity I promised. It sucks being this sick, but what can you do? The biggest political news story in the world currently is United States President Donald Trump taking on four far-left progressive Democrat freshman congresswomen known as the Squad. In a series of tweets, he accuses them of hating America and suggests they go back and help and fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came. Trump has yet again been called racist, and the Democrat-controlled House passed a resolution condemning his tweets, but Republicans now appreciative of his success in office have not succumbed to media pressure to condemn him. Most rational commentators see Trump's attacks on the squad as part of his 2020 re-election strategy to position himself as being the pro-American candidate and the Democratic Party as trying to undermine American values using greatness. The Democrats have been trying to undermine the US southern border security, attacking ICE detention facilities and the raids, and an Antifa member attempted a terror attack on an ICE facility in the US state of Washington, armed with bombs and a rifle, but he was shot dead by police before he could harm anyone. Back in Australia, climbing Ayers Rock is set to be officially banned due to the alleged spiritual significance of the site to Indigenous Australians. There seems to be more of a case in the Indigenous grievance industry are finding another way to tell white people off for being disrespectful. Former Greens leader Bob Brown has decided that he doesn't like wind farms due to their environmental and aesthetic impact, which means he doesn't like coal, hydro, coal seam gas, and now wind power. Does he like any power generation at all, it seems? There have also been more anti Adani protests in Brisbane, which intentionally block peak hour traffic. The Queensland Labor government has reluctantly approved the mine, but it seems they are perfectly happy to enable these disruptive protests led by Marxist groups who don't respect the democratic process. To catch up on all this news, I am joined once again by the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, global politics has been consumed this week uh, by four freshman Democrat congresswomen who are known as the Squad. It is made up of, well, they're a group of far-left progressives who got elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in the 2018 election cycle. There's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of of New York, who she's been a constant source of mockery for a lot of people online. She said stuff like uh, a lot of people are worried about uh, being factually correct rather than uh, being morally right. Uh, There's also Ilhan Omar of uh, Minnesota. She's an American Somali Muslim congresswoman despite being an elected American congresswoman. She seems obsessed with just looking after her uh, fellow Muslims in not just America but worldwide. And then the two lesser known members are uh, Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts and Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. Now, they're all elected in safe Democrat districts. They, they won their, their primaries, and so in the general election, they were guaranteed to get a seat uh, in Congress. Uh, now, they, they had this obsession with wanting to impeach Trump, uh, abolish the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, agency. Uh, it's it's so extreme that they actually voted against uh, border aid because they well they want the the, the southern border uh, torn down. And Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat House Speaker, who is herself pretty far left, she does not like them. She she previously said that uh, a glass of water could have won their congressional districts because they're solid Democrat uh, districts and dismissed their influence because they're. Uh, they're, they're five people. Uh, their media darlings are the, the squad because they, they represent the, the young generation of far-left socialist uh, progressives, but they're completely out of step with mainstream America, the one that people voted for 
in the, the 2016 presidential election and what people normally vote for. Even if they do vote Democrat, they normally vote for a, a Democrat who is, well, even if they are a progressive, they do have at least solid working class credentials. That's right. There, there is a, um, a, a big a big point to make there when it comes to um, their ideologies being of the far left and, and how they are embraced in the mainstream media and also how they're not really in touch with the, the majority of people within society. And Nancy Pelosi saying um, that a glass of water could have won their seats are, is, is quite right. And that's actually a real shame that um, politics in that in that case, or in cases that we even see here locally, uh, that we have these safe seats that basically uh, putting a, a non-candidate in there could even win over um, a, a person that is capable, uh, just because it is that people only vote one way and that it is so heavily in favour of one party over another. And so it's a very accurate statement to make. All of those areas that you've mentioned uh, are very blue areas and that they would be uh, representative in the in the uh, cities of those states. So it, it is not a surprise, and, but it is a very big shame that these people are embraced as heavily as they are. Yeah. People within those districts don't, don't actually think of maybe voting another way just because they're um, solid, rusted on Democrat voter. You'd like to think if that if the the party that normally wins the seat, if they select a complete crackpot to be their candidate, that there's enough voters there to say, no, we will not stand for this. We'd rather vote for uh, the other party. But it seems to be now that, well, because the the Democrat base is is so far left, you just have to look at the the debates where they're all for uh, free college, uh, they're they're all for free healthcare, they're uh, for open borders, uh, they're for you know all all these left LGBT things, and like th that who's who votes in the the primary now, uh, two two of these members of the squad they defeated incumbent democrats in the in the, in the primary so basically as long as they are able to to pander to the far left then they're guaranteed to to get into congress that's true and another thing to to note here is because voting over there isn't compulsory that um the people that do tend to vote are, are very much more passionate um more ideologically um extreme you would say and people that are really motivated in trying to cause a change so someone that is um, rather moderate or centrist has less uh, of a chance to want to um, bother going out to vote than somebody that's from the far left for instance that really wants to um, you know tear down the walls as they like to put it and really cause some uh, so, uh, cause some damage and that's why we see in that sort of system that um, people um, as far left as they are can really prosper because of that and that, that's um at least something that um is very prominent over there but not so much over here although we are starting to see in recent years that people are getting that kind of traction and following down here but at least the people here tend to be a little bit more uh centrist and not as um far to the left within the left and, but they're still, at the end of the day, embraced by their, um, their, their mainstream media that give them a platform. And obviously, uh, another thing, the institutions. Obviously, university, uh, for instance, that breed these types of people and that these types of people uh, really connect with. People that don't have responsibility. People that, um, you know, the idea of having everything handed to them is, you know, something that they could really relate to. Well, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her most serious contribution to the, the Congress, uh, putting aside all of the absurd things she says, is the Green New Deal, which it would cost the US economy $93 trillion over 10 years to completely decarbonize it to get zero emissions, because she believes the world's going to end in 12 years unless uh, unless we uh, reverse catastrophic uh, climate change. So they get, and that hasn't even been supported by a lot of establishment 
uh, Democrats like uh, Senator Dianne uh, Feinstein and Ilhan Omar. Uh, she is a was born in Somalia, then went to refugee camp in Kenya, and uh, then came to America when she was was ten. Like I said before, she she still seems to uh, be a congresswoman for Muslims rather than uh, Americans, and she. There, there's the famous speech that she she made to the uh, uh, the Council on American uh, Islamic uh, Relations, where, where where she decried the the loss of uh, Muslim civil liberties after 9/11, which was uh, some people did something. Yeah, well, that's that's true. And uh, another thing to note is that um, these women here come from, I, I guess you would say, conservative backgrounds in that the countries. Um, of their ethnicities are very conservative. And even though they were born in America, um, whether it was their parents that, uh, for instance, came and immigrated into, into the US, they actually come from very socially conservative backgrounds, yet when they come into the United States, they all of a sudden do a 360 degree turn, get onto this bandwagon of virtual uh, signaling, which is something that the left really push, and all of a sudden, they're pushing LGBT rights, uh, progressive agendas. For yeah, instance, like Elhan Omar, a... she wears the yeah. hijab, yet she support like she's got like a hundred percent rating from the uh, local like LGBT group. Like I doubt you know the the Muslim councils that she addresses uh, are entirely happy with that. Well, that, that, that's that's something that really I mean her own people um, or people of her faith have to come out and, and speak out about her, um, you know, not representing them properly. Because it, it, it is the case that they're really an oxymoron. I mean, like I said, um, they came from really conservative backgrounds. They come into America, they get a taste of this um, liberation or whatever you want to call it, you know, through their universities and, and get told, oh, you know, you can be anything, you can do whatever you want, you know, smash walls down and, you know, be this revolutionary. And all of a sudden, they've basically rebelled against everything that their um, their culture or their religion or whatever else used to stand for. So everything of their parents' background and, and cultural origins, they've basically done a 360 turn and just shit all over it. Um, so this this is something that really you know gets me every time I see these kind of people uh, get into politics um, in the left and all of a sudden be these uh, SJW mouthpieces. And now, President uh, Donald Trump, he had a bit of fun with the uh, dispute between uh, the squad and, and Nancy Pelosi. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez even suggested that uh, Pelosi was a, a racist for uh, uh, not respecting uh, these uh, congresswomen of, of colour. And, and, and Trump was funny, he's like, oh, I have my differences with Nancy Pelosi, but I think, you know, these squad members are being very dis 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 disrespectful. And it was, it was quite amusing for him to sort of like come to Pelosi's defense because that would just uh, make the make make the situation even even more intense uh, but Trump he went uh, all in against the squad on the weekend uh, tweeting why don't they go back and help the f uh, fix the the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came uh, then they can come back and show us how it's done now these t That's uh, right. yeah. these tweets were called racist because three out of the four were born in America. Uh, only Ilhan Omar uh, was born overseas, and he, he he was accused of pandering to white nationalism because he was saying these uh, women are not American because they're uh, not white. But when you say that the United States is fundamentally broken. It was built on you know, slavery, oppression. It's always been about injustice, basically saying that there's nothing good from it ever. Then I think you're entitled to say like, United States is not China or North Korea. If you don't like it, you can go. Yeah, exactly right. And the whole reason why they're there in the first place was because they escaped a shithole, which is something that he would basically have said in the past to come to a country that uh, provided a better opportunity and a better life for their family. I mean, why is it the case that so many of these people come here to this country or to, to the US or any other Western country, and then they've escaped a really terrible country, come to a better country that does give them so much, and then in return, basically, you know, give the middle finger and, um, 
you know, want to turn it into a, a really bad place like their last place that they were at. It just doesn't make sense. But this is something that we see quite often, that they do these things. And um, their, their mentality, really, it just doesn't really... It's really, yeah, mind-blowing. And the squad, they held a press conference uh, where, despite uh, saying that they, they weren't going to take the bait, they, they clearly did because they... They, they called Trump a racist white nationalist and said he was committing human rights abuses at the border. That's been a big thing of the uh, of the squad because even though Trump's enforcing already existing immigration policies, uh, Ocasio-Cortez has said that Trump is running concentration camps, That which is just a ludicrous thing. I mean, the, the people don't people who are migrating from the trying to attempting to legally cross from the southern border like they're actively wanting to walk into concentration camps which is not how it works like you're supposed to be involuntary there i mean if you don't know if you if you illegally try to enter the country you're going to be detained then you're quite uh, naive and like they've spread f uh, fake news these squad members that uh, f the detainees are drinking out of toilets and all, all, all of this uh, f fake news and like they talked about they're their being kept in cages which was an Obama uh, policy I mean all, all like, they seem to forget that uh, Democrats used to believe in border security uh, that, that, that's another reason why the the squad are disliked by establishment Democrats and of course they renewed uh, their their call for Trump to be impeached due to his lawless administration even though the Mueller report uh, cleared him of the the Russia collusion conspiracy they they still believe that there's there's grounds for uh, impeachment well that that's right I mean it, it really shows just how horrible it, it is when you when you have these people come out and, and, and trying to um, you know re put out this fake news and, and, and whatnot, really um, dumb down the nation and, and make them think that certain things are happening when they're not. This is something that we always see happening. It's quite often that, that we see this on, on the news or in articles, that they're really pushing certain agendas. And it's just up to us really to see it for what it is. And the scary thing is really that, um, you know, if these people were ever to become president one day, you know, that um, these kind of candidates where there's many in the running for 2020 for the Democrats, I mean, this this is a, a scary possibility that there's only going to be more of this happening in the future because in the left, things are going further to the left. And we're seeing that here in Australia, we're seeing it overseas in America and, and, and so forth. And to have these kind of candidates it's a very scary prospect and you can only hope that um, they start to pick somebody of the, I guess you could say, the, the more traditional sort of left. And I don't think they really have anybody worth worth uh, counting on paper in that list for 2020 anyway. But um, you, you can only, you can only uh, hope that the left actually start to connect to the working class values that they used to stand for back um, in the old days, you know, like not not the sort of social justice kind of um, um, political agendas that they have now embraced because that's not something that the left ever was about and it's just a total turnaround to what they used to represent. Now Trump has defended his tweets. He, he says he believes based on their actions they hate our country, get a list of the horrible things they have said. Uh, Omar is polling at 8% with the American public, Cortez at 21%. Nancy Pelosi tried to push them away, but they are now forever wedded to the Democrat Party. See you in 2020. Now, this is the consequence of these far left uh, congresswomen winning these safe districts is that they're not going to appeal to the, the Rust Belt states that the Democrats have got to win in 2020, uh, uh, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan as a whole. Uh, because the American people, they still don't like socialism, identity politics. They don't want people talking down America. They want jobs. They want a, a prosperous America, which is safe for their, their families. That's why Trump was elected in, in 2016. And in 2020, it seems that the Democrats, their strategy is to call more people racist, say America is more 
uh, horrible. And this polling refers to, it was an internal Democrat polling that these members of the squad, they're, they're, they're toxic uh, to the uh, American voters. And that's probably part of the reason why uh, Pelosi uh, was trying to distance herself from them. But Trump's tweets have sort of forced her into defending them and them coming together. And so he's fallen into the trap. And uh, uh, now Pelosi is now their biggest cheerleader. That's true. And I think um, one one thing that Trump is doing, which is quite strategic here, and one thing that we can all hope for is that these kind of candidates and the Democrats do get up because they're um, them being on the news every night, them uh, being in the public eye and basically, you know, winning their own districts and being representative of that party is going to turn um, the people against them. You know, this this is something that Trump understands. They're not popular people within the general uh, consensus of, of the community. And if they had candidates like this leading the charge, or even candidates um, that played a significant role in a campaign, always showing them their face and, and reminding voters of this is what the Democrat Party is, then like you said, the Rust Belt states aren't going to turn to them at all. And Trump might even win um, a couple of states that he narrowly missed out on last time. Um, there was a, a couple in the in the in the Rust Belt that he just narrowly missed out, um, and you know, elsewhere as well. And he can they can have him swing to him, you know. So he can definitely do a lot of damage there in the election and um, cause a a big upset because obviously you're already seeing polls come out saying that he's done for. But we've all heard that before, so it's not really something that you can trust nowadays. No, I mean, well, you have to look at Trump's approval rating. It's higher than uh, Obama's was at, at, at that point in his presidency. And of course, Obama got easily uh, re-elected. And the base is now solidly behind Trump. The, the never-Trumpers, they've either fallen into line or just fallen into irrelevancy. Because uh, after Trump's tweets, there was like huge pressure on Republicans to condemn him. But they, they didn't take the bait. They said, well, you know, maybe he shouldn't have like attacked that character, but he is right that they're a bunch of communists, they're, they hate our country. He, he was completely right on that. And they, the Democrats, because they control the, the House of Representatives, they did manage to pass a resolution uh, condemning his tweets, which passed 240 to 187. There were four Republican cucks who voted with uh, the Democrat uh, majority, which, well, only having four re Republicans cuck out, that's, that's, that's not too bad. But it was interesting, there was uh, more Democrats who voted against the impeachment uh, motion. Uh, it was 332 votes to uh, 95. So only 95 Democrats voted for impeachment, which most sensible Democrats know that that's an absurd thing. So there's more rogue Democrats who don't want to go down the... Uh, 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 the far left progressive path than uh, Republicans who are cucking out on Trump. That's right. I actually think that these sort of uh, motions that are put, and I mean, we've seen them at home here when you had uh, uh, people, um, for instance, on both sides of politics come together to condemn Fraser Anning for his comments. And I just don't understand why these sort of motions are put. Uh, I, I just really don't understand why people have to push these virtue signaling um, statements that, oh, yeah, we condemn what this person says, blah, 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 and, and, you know, have a big sook about it. Like, you know, just understand that, you know, these people have different views to you, and that's simply how it is. I mean, um, you don't see anybody on the right, um, you know, putting these motions forward and condemning people on the left for all the stupid things that they say. Um, so really, it's it's just, and another thing I have to note also is, why is it not the case that these people that um, obviously hate the way things are in America, why isn't it that they go to a country that better suits their ideology? I mean, people say this all the time. It, it's quite simple. If you are unhappy with how things are, where you currently are, then go to somewhere that will make you happy. I mean, it's not... Um, being racist, it's not, you know, um, being uh, um, a bigot or being, you know, um, all that he's doing is basically, you know, giving them 
some advice as to if you want to be happy, go to where it is that will make you happy. And if that is Venezuela or China or North Korea or wherever else, just go there, you know, and live there and be happy rather than trying to tear down a country um, because you just disagree with the way that things are going, you know? Well, they know that deep down that America is the greatest country on earth. They, 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 they know that deep down. That's why they don't go anywhere else. That's why. And that's also despite the fact that they want, want to allow all the, uh, the Mexicans in, the, all, the, all the celebrities uh, said, oh, we're not going to move to Mexico if, if Trump's elected. We're going to move to Canada because it's a similar uh, rich and culturally compatible country. Well, that's right. Yeah, they say one thing. Obviously, their uh, bourgeoisie um, sort of uh, tendencies is that they want to live a high life. And these impoverished countries, um, even though they embrace their ideologies, it's it's not something that would really suit their um, high uh, lifestyle, so to speak, uh, to be living in those type of places. And because of this undermining of the the U.S. southern border, because the the NGOs in, in Latin America, they've pushed this migrant caravan, which is going through Mexico uh, to, to the US border, because suddenly because Trump wants to strengthen border security, that means that the, the left, not only do they want open borders, they want to push more people into it. And I mentioned that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's called uh, the detention facilities on the border concentration camps. Well, she actually inspired an Antifa terror attack. Uh, William Van Sprozen, a 69-year-old uh, Antifa activist, he attacked a ICE facility in Tacoma, Washington, which is nowhere near the border. He was armed with a rifle and attempted to set uh, fire to uh, ICE uh, vehicles and trying to explode a a propane gas tank. Uh, thankfully, police uh, intervened and shot him uh, dead and no one else was hurt, but he was treated by Antifa activists all over the world, including here in Australia, as a, a martyr to the cause. And the, the squad members, they refused to condemn this Antifa terrorist. And you know, this is quite scary that you've got... We already knew that, well, Antifa, they are a paramilitary organization, but they, one of them tried to murder federal government agents. That should be alarming. It, it was considered uh, a, a huge national security threat uh, when uh, Brenton Tarrant uh, committed the, the Christchurch massacre. Apparently, uh, nationalists who all condemned him, they were a threat to uh, national security, yet Antifa they've actually su expressed support for a terrorist who is acting in their their name why isn't uh, social media companies cracking down on that why aren't you know, antifa activists why aren't they being monitored by the the, the security agencies because this is pretty horrible it is horrible it, it is um, a terrorist and it should be treated like a terrorist um what needs to happen really is that, first of all, the media have to um, be condemning it as such and really pointing to the group of, um, you know, which is Antifa and, and pointing to people that are connected to that organisation and just, just in the same way that they did here, you know, um, in, in reference to, um, to Christchurch, really make a big deal of this because it is, uh, you know, it was a national threat. Um, and you didn't really hear much about it on the news. And I, I think, um, for instance, uh, another thing to note is that I remember um, over here after Christchurch, for instance, you had um, a TV host um, attacking um, people like, you know, Pauline Hanson, Fraser Anning, and basically blaming them for um, people like Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch shooter, saying that they were to blame because of uh, what happened but you're not seeing for instance um media um going to the squad or any of the other um left-wing um politicians and saying you're the one who caused this you're you're to blame here for this person um, um going about and, and doing this because you're pushing that sort of rhetoric out there and they're not you know obviously touching on antifa being a terrorist organization which is what they are anyway 
it's um it's a really sad case it's just a double standard and it seems to me here i mean um at, at the very least um will and van Bronson look it sounds like a dutch name now i mean it seems i mean you can be a terrorist and be white but if you're on the left it's okay but as soon as you're a, a, a white terrorist on the right then the media just goes into a frenzy you know and eats it up so why hasn't the media gone into you know chaos mode over this guy which happens to be um a white man and, and a terrorist because he's of the left you know it's just a totally different ballpark doesn't suit their agenda obviously well, Antifa is one of the, the whitest uh, political groups that you'll find in mm. in Western nations, even though they claim to uh, protect minorities. But yeah, CNN, they actually visited Seattle and did a, a flattering profile on the local Antifa there. And uh, uh, William Van Sprouten, he was actually, he wasn't interviewed, but you can see him in the, the photo there of the local Antifa there. So... CNN has actually been complicit in promoting a terrorist. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like they're really copying much fl uh, slack over it either. Mm. Um, we, we, hear the, we see this sort of thing all the time. I mean, I, I just remember the amount of ABC um, going undercover, exposing these white nationalist sort of groups in Australia. You know, this big scene that they made, even before Christchurch happened, this was going back last year, they were they were making such a you know a big deal about all these you know groups and stuff and i've just never seen them touch the other side of things i've just never seen it there was one article actually that i had seen um that mentioned um and this was an abc article funny enough and it did mention whether um you know the alt left so to speak was uh, if if that was uh to be a concern just like the alt right is so it was a fairly balanced kind of article and I made one comment on social media saying, I wonder when this journalist is going to get the sack because it just didn't really appeal to their um, to their agenda that they normally are uh, putting out there. It was um, something that you never normally see in the ABC be being fairly balanced and, you know, looking at uh, left-wing organisations that were um, were um, involved in terror activity or, or, you know, that kind of uh, criminal activity anyway, So, which is something that they should be doing, you know. It should be said, should be reported on. But we're just not hearing enough of it. And um, I, I think when you just see the two examples of um, this and of, of Christchurch, for instance, is, you know, it, it just really shows the difference in where their priorities lay. Um, you know, I mean, the way that New Zealand acted after that and the way that, you know, all the virtue signalling for weeks on end in the news, just nonstop, it was just absolutely nuts. I just couldn't believe it. And after all that, of course, they used the perfect opportunity of stealing everybody's weapons too. So, I mean, it, it really it really shows that it, it seems like some things are worse than others, depending on who it is that's doing them. And Trump, for all his talk, like he should... Like there's a White House petition uh, s saying that his administration should label Antifa as a domestic terror organisation. Trump should do this i mean he hasn't made a big deal that ocasio cortez inspired a a terrorist in in the, the manifesto i mean trump could really go all in but he's just not and let's not forget recently uh, antifa in portland assaulting the the journalist uh, andy no i mean there's been plenty of antifa violence i mean he's mentioned them from time to time but he's never taken proper action to say these people are a threat to u.s national security yeah and he should i mean he really should i mean we all know that antifa is um is funded by you know fairly high ups in society and i mean i guess that's always one one case that needs to be noted and why many people don't touch on the subject but it really does need to be touched on and people do need to raise it i mean it doesn't have to be trump himself but it needs to be somebody in politics that needs to talk about this. I mean, we've seen it here, people getting beaten up by Antifa. I mean, we've seen it many times in our own neighbourhoods. We've seen it um, overseas. You see it in Europe where, where they're, you know, smashing down windows of shops and burning cars and everything. They're really violent, really violent. And you don't see that type of activity on the right. I mean, and Christchurch was really a, a, an example that really stood out because, I mean, that was something 
that you don't see very often on the right happening at all. I mean, yeah. and that's if you call him right wing at all anyway, because, I mean, in his manifesto, um, he, he did say that he had connections with communism and eco-fascism and stuff like that. So, I mean, just because he was a nationalist, it doesn't mean he was necessarily right wing, but um, it was just put that way to make the right wing look bad. But, I mean, it, it's not something you see every day. It's very rare, but it's very, very... I mean, you can just see all of the protests that are happening... Um, with, if it was a feminist protest, a, a climate protest, people are really, you know, they're, they're not peaceful at all. You know, they're gluing themselves to streets. They're screaming at the top of their lungs. Just, They're just nuts. They're absolutely nuts, you know, these people. And you just see the difference. When the right do a protest, they are peaceful. I mean, you know, they do their little march. They do some speeches. But it's not as, as, um, as aggressive as the left are. And I mean, to, to that effect, maybe that's why the left in a lot of ways are winning because they seem to be a lot, of, a lot more passionate about what they believe in, whereas the right are just a lot more softer. So even though the right are, are more sensible in the approach, um, ultimately it does also cost them a lot of votes too because a lot of people just think, oh yeah, these guys are just cucks. Um, whereas the left are really going out there and, you know, they're spending, wasting their weekends, you know, doing this, doing that whereas people on the right are just sitting at home on their ass and whinging on social media. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword there, really. Back in Australia, uh, it's been in the news this week that uh, climbing on Ayers Rock in Central Australia is set to be outlawed uh, in October. Uh, now, this is uh, because of the uh, views of the Angu, Angu people who are now the Aboriginal traditional landowners of Ayers Rock. Uh, now it's called Uluru because it's a, a secret site to them and climbing it uh, is uh, insensitive. Now, Pauline Hanson, uh, One Nation Senator, has made the point, like, why is it why is it going to be banned now? I mean, climbing's been happening on it for, for 50 plus years. There's going to be lost revenue to the Indigenous uh, communities. And it seems to me that... Uh, this ban for cultural sensitivity reasons, it it, it seems it seems to me that it's it's just a another way for you know, self-appointed indigenous leaders and their their allies uh, to demonise white people to say you're oppressing us. Why now is it offensive? Yeah, it is something like that. I mean, it's something that we see quite often, and. At the end of the day, like you mentioned, um, Ayers Rock has been climbed on for, for many decades now. It has actually brought uh, tourism to that part of, uh, of the country. I mean, I can guarantee you that if you automatically, um, I think they were saying in October, they were looking at doing this, closing it down and not having anyone walk on it, that would mean that the Northern Territory would have not many people traveling to it because there's not a lot there. I mean, but what, what, what do people think when they think Northern Territory, they think Ayers Rock. I mean, that, that's what the Northern Territory really what stands out. So if you're cancelling now um, people being able to experience Ayers Rock to the fullest, then they have no business going there in the first place to, to the Northern Territory and nobody's going to go. The, the tourism industry there is going to lose a lot of revenue and the indigenous communities are going to lose out as well. I mean, it's ridiculous also the fact that a rock, which is um, part of nature, is something that these particular group of people, the Aboriginal people, own. How can you own a rock? You can't yeah. own a rock. Like the comparisons, <laughs> comparisons being made that, oh, it'd be insensitive to climb a cathedral or the war memorial but that's something man built a rock is a natural mm. formation and given that i mean crown land like it belongs mm. to to all of us this is what's so confusing about like these these native title title land rights does does the land belong to what is the nation australia or is it does it belong to have we given it all back to who are alleged to be the the traditional owners. I mean, why does some parts of Australia get to be owned by people based on race while the rest of it is, is, is common land? And yeah, rock is a natural formation. Nobody built it. Mm. Why out of all the other rocks and natural sites in Australia, why is that one 
decided to, to give to people of a certain race. That's exactly right. I mean, it doesn't make much sense at all. Uh, it is a, a natural formation. It's a rock. Um, nobody has the right to own a rock um, unless it is um, in somebody's uh, land that they purchased um, with their own money. I mean, you, you can't you can't justify. I mean, this is this another thing when it comes to land rights. Um, people own land because they've actually bought the land. Um, they've, you know, got the deeds to it and all, and all of that sort of thing. I mean, these people here don't have deeds to their land. They were nomads. They, they were people that uh, travelled around um, and never really just stayed in the one spot. I mean, and and you know, had that area as home for the rest of the, for for all their um, ancestors. And I mean, they were all over the place. You know. And that one group of tribal um, Aboriginal people that currently are there, who's to say that that group was um, somewhere else in the country and that another group was, was in that area in the past? Um, when you're going back thousands of years, you just don't know these things. So it's an alleged, it's allegedly that they um, are, are the, the first people to, to settle there, but you just don't know these things. And they don't really have any right to uh, um, to something that isn't, I mean, it's not a cathedral. It's not a opera house. It's not a. It's not a building. It's not something that they built. It's something that just naturally appeared there. So how is it that they have any ownership to it? It's beyond me. I just don't understand it. And if we are to have this referendum, and then they are included and seen as Australians in the constitution, then surely that would mean that they have to give up all their land rights. Because if that's the case that they're Australian, then everything that belongs to them should be crown land then all of a sudden, shouldn't it? <laughs> well, we don't know how this indigenous voice uh, will work. That's the, that's the thing. And there's, there's been a further development uh, this week with oh, corporations, uh, uh, shock and surprise, have decided to engage in virtue signaling, saying we all support this indigenous uh, voice to parliament. Uh, Scott Morrison, uh, you should uh, reconsider. But yeah, it's it just makes it so confusing. Is is Australia a country? Uh, does this Indigenous voice mean that Australia is going to become one, or are we we still going to have these separate land titles? I huh. mean, this is what's so confusing about it all. It is, and I think that needs to be determined before we even go to the ballot here. Um, I mean, uh, there is obviously for a lot of reasons people that would be against um, having this change in the constitution at all. And um, not, not only for the part that it's not going to help them at all, and, and it's just basically a virtue signaling. I mean, they talk about the, you know, putting up a notion of it's okay to be white and how bad that was, even though that was basically to prove a point. Yet what they're doing now to have them in the constitution is the exact same thing on the other side of the spectrum. It's just to make a, a political point. That's all it is. I mean, it just, you know, one side was okay, the other side was, you know, bigoted and, and, and nasty. Um, but another thing being, like I said, I mean, if they are Australian people, then they can only own what they have bought with or purchased with money. I mean, you can't you can't just own something because oh, your ancestors were here so many years ago. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, you know, this is a country and has been for many, you know, many years now. It's not like in the old days where, um, you know, people went to a land there was nobody there and just claimed it as their own and put a flag on it. It's not like that. I mean, this is an actual country here. You, you can't, no matter how long you think you've been here, um, say that you own a piece of land when you don't. And, I mean, if they are Australian and are seen as Australian in the Constitution, then they even have less right to have, um, you know, all these... Uh, these um, land rights because then they're seen as Australian and they should only own what they have bought and what they haven't bought should be just crown land because it belongs to them and belongs to everybody as one. But of course that isn't going to work out that way because they've got their special privileges. And then of course we saw uh, Pauline Hanson when she was opposing the, the Ayers Rock climbing van, she was on with uh, Steve Price and uh, was moderated by the Today Show, uh, Deborah Knight, and apparently this was a big outrage because it was three white people debating an Aboriginal issue. Well, this is what I was getting back to, like, it's not even about Aboriginal people, it's about a rock. 
I mean, it's not about like <laughs> it's the, is the rock Aboriginal. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. You know, it's just a rock. Um, if it was not a rock, it would be a tree. It would be a you know um, a, a pond. It would be a, you know, it, it's it's a feature that is there because it, it just happened to be there. It wasn't there because somebody put it there. Um, it wasn't built. It wasn't you know n nobody done anything to it. Um, it. It looks the same as you know. Yes, it is a very big rock. But it looks like any other rock. Um, there's nothing particularly um, special about it, although they might claim that there is some sort of spiritual connection that they have to it. But, I mean, if that's the case, can anybody go to a mountain or a tree or any sort of natural feature and say, I have a connection with this particular thing, that means I own it? Like, I mean, is that what it's going to come down to it? My grandfather came here and, you know, he always loved this tree and then my father and then me. So does that mean that I can own this piece of land? even though I have no deeds to it, I haven't paid a cent to it. it. It really, I mean, the thing that really makes me upset is that politicians have caused this themselves, you know. I mean, um, the Aboriginals have actually, um, over, you know, most most of the time, um, have, haven't really been ones to um, go out there and, and, and put a lot of complaints forward. It's the far left that have caused these issues and have baited them. You know, they've really been the leaders into these movements and they have pushed them and gone to the Aboriginal people and said, look how oppressed you are being, you know, these, you know, white people are doing this to you, they're doing that to you. I mean, if you, if you were to cancel that out, then most of the time, more so than not, Aboriginal people wouldn't be even bringing these topics of conversation up. I mean, they only bring it up because they're really being um, pushed that way. And these other people that are white people that are pushing it have their own twisted agendas behind it. You know, they're really trying to, you know, as I, as I said before, tear down the walls and change society and destroy any um, sort of Australian identity or culture or, or, or whatever else that they're, they're trying to go for. But yeah, they're really baited. They're really baited into it. And if you go to an Aboriginal in the bush and talk to them, someone that isn't really in tune with politics and that is doing their own thing, then, you know, they're just living their own life, doing what they want to do. And a lot of people won't even, you know, um, bat an eye about these things. Um, there's even been an elder of, of, a, of a tribe that was down over at, um, around Ayers Rock area. And they, they said that they were fine with people climbing mm. it. They didn't even care. So this, this is what I mean, you know, the, far, the people on the left are really pushing this stuff. They're really pushing for it. So um, in many cases, this is just to cause division. It's to cause people like um, myself, you and many others um, to feel like they're being, um, you know, their identity is being attacked. And then, you know, we're then turning on to the Aboriginal people and saying, oh, you're doing the wrong thing here. And then the Aboriginal people are then turning on us. And it's all a divide and conquer. That's what they're all about. And um, this is something that they really play at and they really push. And there's been a surge in, in tourism uh, to the rock uh, before the ban comes in. So clearly the, the market, there is a large market there. The, the public likes climbing the rock. They like that natural experience. And yet, but no, because uh, as you mentioned, a selective a group of Indigenous people have decided it's insensitive. This tourism operation and you know, something that people want to experience they're well they're told to feel guilty about the experience and now you can no longer have that experience anymore future generations won't won't get to even go near the rock yeah and i can guarantee you that the the aboriginals that are offended are the widest aboriginals you'll ever see oh you can't <laughs> say that uh you know you'll get pulled before the uh human rights commission for, i mean for... honestly 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 though if you go and see an Aboriginal over in the desert, I mean, they're normally um, not speaking nonsense like the ones that, the ones that are out and really pushing these agendas. I mean, really going and attacking uh, and, and going for this. I mean, they are only, um, well, I don't want to use the term half caste, but they're not full-blooded Aboriginals. They're, they're, they're a mixture of, 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 of Ab Aboriginal and, and obviously European descent. And they're the ones that are most critical about it, you know? And that's what makes me laugh the most. I mean, people that are 100% uh, Aboriginal that don't really, you know, have any uh, concerns, 
yet the the ones that are politicians, for instance, um, and other ones in the media, and you look at them and, and they're really pushing this and you think, okay, what what percentage of Aboriginal are you exactly, you know? I mean, and why is it that your 5% of Aboriginal um, is something that you claim so much in your, um, in your identity, yet the 95% that isn't seems to be, you know, basically shit to you. Um, <laughs> Because obviously that's where the privilege is. So they're going to go for whatever they feel um, they can get out of and that their privilege is. Um, but yeah, like a lot of people, when it comes down to it, it's going to destroy the, the state economy there. Um, if people can't climb that rock, they'll climb something else. There will be another tourist attraction. Um, you know, it could come from a, um, a premier or someone else that suggests, oh, how about... Uh, this particular mountain, this hill, this rock, this whatever, you know, and people will come up with something else um, due to this being cancelled and being out of consideration, you know. People will come out with something else and they will gain from that because that's all it is at the end of the day. It's um, something that has happened for many decades. People have thought, oh, yeah, this is a great thing to climb because it's something that is well known to do. And if we can't go there, we'll go somewhere else. It's that simple. So they'll lose out, someone else will gain. Former Greens leader Bob Brown, he's decided that he doesn't like uh, wind farms anymore due to their environmental and aesthetic impact. Uh, this is because he's made this decision because there is a $1.6 billion proposal to build 163 turbines on Robins Island, which is near his uh, home in the, the northwest. He says it's a... Uh, aileron too far. He cited concerns about the size of the turbines, that the impact on views and dangers uh, posed to uh, local uh, birds and that it could ruin the uh, wild and scenic uh, Tasmanian landscape, including the, the forest. So Bob Brown now, he, he doesn't like coal, obviously, because of its CO2 emissions. Doesn't like hydro because let's remember that uh, in 1983 he opposed the the damming of the the Franklin uh, River, which would generate hydro electricity. Doesn't like coal seam gas, which is another environmentally friendly form of energy. Now he's opposed to wind power, and so is he for generating electricity at all? Like that's a, like he's pretty much out of options. Well, that's right. I mean, what does he actually support? What does he like? Um, he seems to like... I mean, does he like nuclear power? No, <laughs> no, no. It will cause <laughs> meltdown. Yeah, that's right. I mean, but, but that's the thing. Like, I mean, it, it's easy enough to come out and say, we hate this, we hate that. But what do you actually um, want to replace it with? Like, what do you suggest is the way to go? And you're even saying now that wind power is a problem which, I mean, a lot of people would say that's the case. But what, what do you plan on using? You know, I mean, you're running out of options. There's not many things to choose from now, is there? Um, unless you want to go back in the old days and um, before we had electricity at all and we can use, uh, you know, candles, um, you know, by the bedside. We can use lanterns. I mean, even though, you know, that would probably be, you know, too much emissions for him too. I mean, um, but... Well, what do we do at the end of the day? That, that's the thing. I mean, people want to know, okay, what's the options? Um, it's quite easy to say that there's things that you disagree with that you don't like and for whatever reason, but what do we replace it with? Um, and for the climate change election to have taken place, they've lost. They lost the election, yet they're still going with this. They're still pushing it. Um, I mean, they just don't learn, you know. They're, they're, they're trying to sort of change their tactics and try and change words here and there but at the end of the day it's not that it's simply that people aren't supporting this on a larger scale because what the people uh think is going on by watching the media over on you know uh, the six o'clock news isn't what's happening in the rural homes of australian people you know the, the the people that go and vote so at the end of the day give us the options bob you know tell us what your plans are um, because at the moment, you know, the country has to run on some sort of power here. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's another, well, it's probably the worst example of NIMBYism because, well, it's going to oh, ruin uh, my, my views in the area. And he also said, oh, the power's not going to be just confined to Tasmania. It's, it's going to benefit other 
areas. Well, hang on, like if you're a responsible global citizen, shouldn't you want wind power to generate as as many places as possible, just not your own backyard? I mean, that just seems pretty selfish. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's just the hypocrisy of it all, really, isn't it? Like, um, it, it just, you know, if, if you're supposed to be for these renewables, then you should be, you know, pushing these renewables. I mean, you should be practicing what you preach. I mean, a lot of these people don't even have sun panel, uh, you know, their solar panels on their on the roof of their homes. You know, I mean, you, you saw that with Stegall in, in, in the debate with Abbott. I mean, she even said, oh, yeah, you know, haven't got any uh, solar panels on the roof. You know, haven't got time, drives a four-wheel drive, you know, consumes a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, pollution and so forth, puts pollution out there. It's just, they, they, they say one thing and don't do it, and don't do it in, in reality. Um, I mean, that's why we have no respect for these people, because we can't even say that they're passionate about what they believe in, because ideally they're, they're not even following their own beliefs. You know, at the very least, we could point to somebody whether we like them or not, and say, okay, this person is for real. This person lives what they preach, you know, and these people don't. And it's putting him at odds with the, the federal Greens policy, but, uh, I mean, Bob Brown, he's fallen out of favour with a lot of the, the Greens' uh, new establishment. I mean, the Marxists in the parties don't like him, and a lot of the left ba blame Bob Brown for the uh, re-election of the Morrison uh, government and the huge LNP swings in, in Queensland because Bob Brown had the Stop Adani convoy which went from Tasmania up to central Queensland and people in central Queensland didn't didn't like it too much and said to these Ad anti Adani protesters, uh, we don't want you here, we're not going to serve you, go away. Yeah, hopefully he does it next time around as well. You know, <laughs> I mean, hopefully it's something that you... <laughs> that he re reoccurringly does it. I mean, even if he doesn't do it, I'm just hoping that people in those areas remember it and don't forget next time around because people have a habit of punishing people at an election and then at the next election just, you know, doing a 180 and saying, oh, yeah, they've learnt their lesson and voting the other way. I mean, it doesn't work that way. I mean, when you want to punish people, you make sure it's for the long haul, you know, until they change. I'm not saying, you know, don't ever vote for the for the opposition at all like i mean you know if the opposition had decent policy you know, i'd be happy to vote for him but unfortunately they don't um that's the reality that's why they were rejected by the the public and they haven't learned from this i mean we're seeing the same issues being pushed in that party the rhetoric is the same they're saying as, as soon as they lost they said well you know it was because we weren't able to explain our positions properly didn't say that it was, you know, due to the problems of, of what they were pushing. And all they ended up saying was that the problem was in their tax policies and not in, you know, policies like the climate policies or uh, their social policies of other sorts, which really, I think, is where they lost it. I mean, even more so than the economic um, uh, issues that they had, I think the social policies they had really destroyed their chances of election. Um, and I think that needs to be said. Now, the, the anti-Adani movement, uh, despite the fact that uh, they, they lost the, the federal election, especially in Queensland, uh, where the, the mine is to be built, they still uh, are not uh, giving up. Uh, in fact, uh, some have called for civil uh, disobedience to, to stop the, the mine, and we've seen countless uh, anti-Adani protests in, in Brisbane. And, and of course, these are not just normal protests in a park somewhere they deliberately block uh, traffic there were two this week there was one on monday and one on wednesday and then there was another one back on friday the the 5th uh, of july and uh, none of these uh, protests and there's hardly any there there's like 10 to 15 there uh, because mm. the they get such a, a light punishment in the courts the the police don't bother charging them and it seems to be enabled even though the, the Palaszczuk government ended up approving the mine, they, they didn't really want to. They, they did it out of political necessity, otherwise they'd be wiped out uh, at, the, at the next state election. But they, they secretly like the, the anti adani protesters, and so they've been fine with enabling it. I know that the, the state LNP, uh, led by opposition leader Deb Frecklington, she's been you know, running hard. How are these people able to block uh, peak hour... 
uh, traffic. And let's uh, a lot of people know that the real power in the Palaszczuk government is the Deputy Premier Jackie Trad, and she's also the Treasurer. She is the member for South Brisbane, which is basically the Antifa uh, lefty area of Brisbane. And it mm. seems such an unrepresentative state of affairs that a representative from the most left-wing electorate in the state is able to have such influence because she didn't want the Adani mine to approve. She suggested, oh, these workers should get a job uh, retraining, that she is able to make the decisions about what happens to workers hundreds of kilometers away. I mean, it just seems so unrepresentative and you just know that the Palaszczuk government, their, their heart's still not in this project. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it, they are doing it out of necessity because they don't want to be destroyed next time around. And I think people are going to see through that. I hope they see through that and really punish them regardless because it did take them their time um, for that decision to be made. And it was obviously conveniently after the election that they did this. But they could have made this decision a long time ago, you know, much more earlier than the election. And they waited and they you know, done it just because they had to. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that, that continually happens. You're also said from different areas of, of Australia, putting their views in and, you know, telling other people what to do. I mean, when you're in an electorate, then each electorate has its own issues. And Adani is in one part of the country. And really anyone that lives outside of that part in the country shouldn't even have a say on it because it's got nothing to do with people like me and you that live nowhere near it. It's got to do with the workers in that area, their families and so forth. And if the people that live in those areas support it, then at the end of the day, it, it should be given the tick. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it is what it is, you know, like you, you can't be from Melbourne. I mean, if, if I could just imagine if there was a, a local issue happening down in, um, say, for instance, Melbourne or, or Sydney or something like that. And, and then you had a bunch of, of people on the right, you know, going in, marching there and, and campaigning in these um, electorates and telling them that they're doing the wrong thing and so forth. That would have just caused so much of a, a stir, so much of a, a big deal. Uh, but it's not, you know, like, I mean, it is reported on. Obviously, they're always called peaceful activists and always, you know, seen as, you know, these um, rebellious types of people that are trying to, you know, do the best because we're you know becoming you know to the level of extinction and at the end of the day people have to call it out it's extremism you know they're they're blocking off traffic they're causing delays they're um you know they're nut jobs really uh, and they're they're only a small amount of them too this is this is the thing i mean when the right right wing have a rally and say 20 30 people 50 people turn up you know, the media makes fun of them, calls them, you know, extremists, say, oh, you know, that these people are running funeral processions, that they're useless, that, you know, um, they didn't get a good turnout and so forth. Yet these people here only have 10 people there. Uh, nobody says anything of that. Nobody says, oh, look at this epic failure from the left or whatever doing their, you know, their extreme climate climate change rallies. Nobody says anything like that. It's just a total different attitude. Um, so to me, I would say that people that are gluing themselves on streets and, you know, uh, practicing this, uh, alarmism, which is what it is trying to scare people in, in, you know, telling people that we're all going to become extinct very soon. And this is something that also started in the seventies, been going for decades, this whole activism of, oh, you know, an ice age is coming, sea levels are coming up and it never happens. You know, I mean, if you were to he actually listen and, and believe what these people were saying, we would have been extinct many times now, but it never has happened. And they continue to be um, given a platform and nobody seems to have any, any anything to negative to say about them, uh, at least not, not in the mainstream, they don't anyway. And I think it's good that some people like uh, Christensen and others, um, I have noticed on his social media, he's uh, come out against uh, these people and called them extremists, which was good, I think. I think many people have to take that approach and really call it out for what it is. Well, there's two different groups that are sort of vying for uh, supremacy in this anti-Adani protest. There's the uh, extreme environmental group, Extinction 
uh, rebellion, uh, they, their, de their demands are that uh, governments enact uh, legally binding policies to achieve zero uh, net emissions by 2025, and that uh, climate decisions should be coordinated by citizens' assemblies. They've been lobbying for uh, governments to declare climate uh, emergencies. They're very responsible for disruptive protests in the, the UK and and other uh, places. So, you know, as the, as the name uh, suggests, uh, they, they do believe that uh, catastrophic uh, uh, climate change is is going to cause uh, human extinction and ecological collapse. But uh, another group that's active in the protest is surprise, surprise, a uh, Marxist group uh, under the banner Uni Students for Climate Justice, which is full of socialist alternative members. One of the organisers is a gentleman called Carl Jackson. Another one is Catherine uh, Robertson, who, well, she's not even a local to Brisbane. She's actually from uh, Melbourne. Uh, she campaigned with the Victorian mm. Socialists. This is all done by our uh, Antifa expert, uh, Lucas Rosas, at the uh, the Unshackled. But yeah, the, the, the mainstream media, they, they lap up this activism saying, look at these noble 10, 15 people blocking traffic. They glorify them. And in fact, Channel 7 <laughs> in Brisbane did a segment, uh, like actually went into the workshops of these anti-Dunny things, like teaching them how to break the law, how to how to block block traffic. I mean, it was it was just incredible. Well, I'm not surprised um, that you you don't have people like ASIO on their back. Which really, I mean, like I said before, they they really should be going on their back because these people are more the most extremist of types that are in our society. I'd say um, yeah, nobody's monitoring them. Nobody cares about what's going on in their circles. Um, it, it's really sad to see. It, it's really, I mean, the, the thing that really annoys me as well is when you see children getting brought into this, skipping school and getting involved in these protests that are doing nothing for their education and getting brainwashed, you know, really brainwashed into this religion because that's what it is. It's this new age cult, um, this climate change, um, you know, social justice type of thing it really is treated like such and they're just worshipping it and lapping it up um, and you know these are the type of people like I've seen videos of people coming out and saying I'm not going to have kids because I don't want to affect the climate I mean yeah that's what Miley Cyrus has said she's not going to reproduce yeah. until we fix climate change which I'm happy about I don't want Miley yeah. Cyrus to reproduce <laughs> yeah that's true but I mean it just it just saddens me that like it's got into that stage where these young people are have been brainwashed in such a way to hold those type of views you know that you know having kids now is you know um a, like oppressing the environment you know it's it's going so much against the environment i mean um it, it makes you think or whatever well if if that's the case or whatever like why i mean you guys supporting euthanasia or whatever maybe you should do yourself a favor i don't want to be advocating that sort of thing but um, they, this is the hypocrisy of it all at the end of the day. Like, you know, these, these people here, they um, are telling people that we shouldn't be um, reproducing or that, you know, that they're, they're pro-abortion, pro-euthanasia. They basically want to kill people off and, and, and depopulate the, 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 the community. But at the same time, they're also, you know, bringing mass immigration in. You know, they, these are the people that are boosting our population numbers. And that's why even if you were not even to touch on the social complex or the even the economic and just simply say, hold on a second, um, environmental reasons, and this is something that's actually the um, Sustainable Australia, they actually make this point quite well is, well, hold on a second, mass immigration is causing damage to the environment. And this is something that they should, if you're really concerned about the environment, then the last thing you would want is, you know, mass immigration numbers. Um, but instead, yeah, it's okay for us to bring people in, um, but then we have to depopulate ourselves, you know. We can't just stop immigration and continue on as we are now, nice and steady. No, 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 we'll still bring the people in, but we, we depopulate our own family, so then we don't have any lineage anymore. Um, and And then, you know, to fill the void, we'll just get all these third worlders to come in and, and take our place. Uh, it, it's such it's such a scary, you know, so, so many things to be said about it. And, you know, kids get caught up in it. Um, 
and people are just yeah like i said they treat it like a religion you know i mean it's just absolutely chaotic hopefully just like all they have to do is look at the since the 70s 80s 90s i mean when i was going to school they were teaching about the ozone layer and this and that and all these things and nothing happened you know i mean and they're continuing to buy the lies so when is it that people are going to realize that this is all a scam um i just hope they do well, I th well, as the federal election demonstrated, the, the voters as a whole have realised that, and that's why they elected the, the Morrison government and uh, delivered a landslide to the LNP in, in Queensland. It just seems the final stage in, in this process is to make sure that these fringe minority protesters can't grind their city to a halt, and if the, the, the Palaszczuk government is unwilling to, to pass uh, stronger laws against them, then they've got to be replaced. Let, let, let's also remember that Palaszczuk government has been slow to uh, act uh, with laws against uh, uh, farm invasions uh, by uh, vegans. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And I mean, I think I think we can basically admit now that Palaszczuk is going to lose um, when the election comes. But now we just have to hope that when the LNP end up getting in that they're going to be a much better um, a voice when it comes to these kind of things and I, I really hope um, at, at least with Frecklington being a, a regional um, candidate um, within the nationals that she's going to be able to actually stand up and, and represent farmers and, and you know go hard on these kind of extremists that are doing this sort of damage I really hope that's the case it's not something that's going to affect us being in different states but at the end of the day, it's going to affect the people living in Queensland, many of the people that, you know, listen to this podcast and that have concerns that are living in these areas and are really seeing the impacts or feeling the impacts when you see um, a lot of people going and causing damage in the cities, um, you know, protesting all, all this rubbish, you know. I mean, uh, and not to mention all the farmers that are getting, you know, people going on their property and um, getting told what to do and what not to do. Um, it, it's really scary, and I, I, it, there's times like this that I really wish we had the laws that the US did when it comes to these sort of things, that um, people really have a right that if anyone was to go on their property, they could just, you know, rein in on them, you know, because <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, it is that right that sh someone should have, you know. People shouldn't be coming onto your property uninvited and definitely... Um, not, you know, going on your and stealing livestock and, and, you know, doing damage to your property, not even just stepping on it, but damaging in the property and, um, you know, your, your animals and, and, and whatnot that you have on the farm. And this is something, you know, the farmers have no rights here. You know, that, that's the problem. They've got no rights whatsoever. And it's always um, the criminals, they get away with these things. They get slap on the wrists oh, yeah, great job, you know, of doing this type, type of activist work, and that's it, you know, and then they do it the next time around because they know they could get away with it. So we really need laws like this that um, allow people to have this freedom of, um, you know, claiming um, um, authority and being able to uh, defend themselves and their lands, their properties, you know. I mean, and unfortunately, we don't. Well, that seems to be the theme of uh, tonight, despite the fact that the, the public at large, well, they're voting for nationalist, uh, economic, uh, those who promise uh, economically prosperous policies, they're voting for those at the ballot box. It seems that those that they are voting for are unwilling to basically crack down on the the rogues and well, the, the the terrorists, whether they be Antifa, vegans, or radical environmentalists, who are basically trying to thwart the the will of the people. So you know, Scott Morrison, Donald Trump, we voted you in to to, to basically make sure that these pe these people can't sabotage our society. Yet you're not acting on it. Yeah, they need to stand up. You know, and I mean, it, people have to realise that it's not. I mean, you hear this all the time, actually, that people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the alternative would have been worse. But we shouldn't be thinking like that. I mean, the people we choose should be doing their best. You know, we shouldn't be just selecting people that are the less worse option. Um, unfortunately, that's what politics has become because both sides are terrible. But we really need to get into a state where 
um, we're voting for people that we really believe in and that represent um, our ideologies and um, our goals and aspirations and, and whatever else, you know, that are really going to do a good job for this country. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, people are voting for the, the least worst candidate. The candidate would do the, do the less damage. Um, and it's sad, you know, it's, it's sad that that's the case, but more and more as time goes on, we're not seeing much of a difference. And we're seeing a bit of difference in some areas of Europe, for instance, that are really showing a divide there, really showing that people want to go down um, a more nationalist sort of path, want to, you know, turn away from that sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, the same old agenda, you know, want to go anti-establishment and really make a, a dent. And I mean, Trump did initially represent that. A lot of people would say that he's gone soft or not really doing enough. And hopefully people will continue to press him and whoever else is in power to do the same. Um, people like Morrison, for instance, and, and what are else. Um, and that, that, that's why we also have minor parties as well, at least in Australia, because they're supposed to be also pushing these issues as well and um, keeping the majors to account. And I hope they do. So I, I really, that, that is the hope that I have for the future. Hopefully we'll be in a state where we would actually have candidates where we can fully rely and put in and, and entrust in and, and everything like that. I just don't know if that's going to happen, unfortunately, but uh, I'm just hoping that it's the case. Yeah, well, we'll continue to, to monitor these uh, developments and fingers crossed that we don't see a oh, radical left which is enabled and there's more decisive action taken against them. And uh, we'll be back to we'll discuss what the latest is on, on the next show next week, Damien. So I appreciate you coming back on to discuss it with me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. And that's the show for today. I hope soon to be able to bring you multiple shows per week again with some new guests featured, so stay tuned for those. There are still plenty of Detonation episodes being produced by my colleague Steel Archer, featured on the Unshackled's YouTube channel, so make sure you check those out. He's had plenty of interesting guests exploring a vast range of topics. The Uncuckables is also back this week. Uh, the XYZ team are back to full health, so uh, we're back at the regular uh, time with the Rational Rise team live every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Melbourne time. Make sure you have subscribed to the Uncuckables YouTube channel so you're notified when the show goes live and so you can watch the live replay in case you miss the show. We're noticing that Facebook is continuing to play tricks on us. Sharing to multiple Facebook groups has been disabled on our page, though we are still producing enough relevant news to break the algorithm. But in case the plug is ever pulled from us by big tech, we are on free speech social media. We're on gab.ai slash the unshackled. We're on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. We are also on mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And of course, we have our growing Telegram channel on their popular encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled remember the best method of supporting our work and to make sure we can reach as many people as possible and produce timely relevant content is to support us financially we're on patreon.com slash the unshackled we're also on paypal.me slash the unshackled we also have our premium membership option on our website the unshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at the unshackled.net slash donate we are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled thanks once again for your company and we'll see you very soon on the next show Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.